crawling off on this, uh, crawling across the stage, mind going after its own business. This is a this is either a, a gruesome or an absurd picture. It's either a cartoon or a horror movie. What Paul is painting here. This is not the way that a body should function, and yet the church at Corinth was all over the place. It had eyes over here, arms and legs over there, and it was a mess, an absolute mess. The church is called by God to build one another up, not to scatter one another about. The church is called by God to glorify him through enabling its members to gather to fellowship toward the image of Christ, who is the head of the body that is the church. And so we have a responsibility, according to these paragraphs here in chapter 12, to understand how it is that we can function together as a unified whole while still retaining our individuality because you need the different members of a body for it to function. So we are all one body. This is a restatement of what Paul has been discussing with them. And it's important to remember that God intends us to use everything that he has given us for his glory. Um, let's, let's take a, a brief review and preview rabbit trail. The church at Corinth's problem, well, they had lots of problems, but I think, I think the, the central problem from which everything else came was that they were treating church as a place for them instead of treating church as a place for God's glory and a place where they could serve their brothers and sisters in Christ unto God's glory. And so they came to church selfishly, planning to make it a place where they would elevate and glorify and exalt themselves. That's what the church at Corinth was largely doing. And almost, I don't even want to say almost, all the problems that Paul deals with from chapter 1 all the way through here into chapter 12, 13, and 14 spring from that issue. And the, the solutions that he gives them, the way that he addresses these problems is twofold. And one of them we've been talking about repeatedly. The other is going to be chapter 13. But the first is, God has told us what the main thing is, and it's his glory. Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, I am the center of it. I am the point. Look at me. I am worth looking at, not me, God. This is what God is saying. God is saying, I am the most beautiful, glorious, and, and worthy one ever because I made everything. You should be looking at me. You should be admiring me out loud and in your heart and to your neighbor and your coworkers and among yourselves as the body of Christ through song, through conversation, in everything that you do, whether you eat or drink, I am the main thing, God has been saying. And this is a solution to all of their problems because they have been saying, many individuals in the church have been saying, I am the main thing. I'm the main thing. Look at me. I, I have gifts. I speak in tongues. Look at me. I'm wealthy. I'm a patron. I provide for others. Look at me. I'm not married, and so I can focus on ministry. Look at me. I'm married, and so I have a family. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. It's just that's all that they were doing. And so the first solution to this is God's like, look at me. Y'all are messed up. I'm not. I am the best. And as you look at me, as you admire me, you are doing what you were made to do. It is ordinate. It is fitting. Look at me, and many of your issues will fade into the background, will solve themselves. As we look forward now um, to the still more excellent way that we're going to be previewing today and looking at in greater depth over the next few weeks, God says in addition to the vertical aspect of your problems, you have a horizontal aspect to your problems. I have given you many gifts for the upbuilding of the body of Christ. But the most excellent way, the most important way, the foundational means whereby you interact with one another is love. Love for one another. He's not speaking about love for him. He's speaking about love for one another. And so there is a vertical aspect to this issue. And that is that they were not treating God as the main thing. They thought they were the main thing. And the horizontal aspect of this issue is that, that if God is the main thing, then they're going to behave like he did. And God's ultimate self-revelation is Jesus Christ. And what did he come to do? He came to glorify the Father and to sacrifice anything that could be sacrificed to confer a benefit on us. And so we, ha we have here two 
two degrees of solution, the horizontal and the and the the horizontal and the vertical degrees of this solution. And so we're going to get into that in greater depth next week, but the, these people, they've misunderstood that. We are all a body of Christ together, and the, the organ that holds us together, did you know that your skin is an organ? Your skin's an organ. The skin of the church is love. The organ that holds us together, that keeps the guts in, that covers the ugly bits, right? It's love. We must choose to love, I'm sorry, Angela. We must choose to love one another. We really need to make the choice because sometimes I do unlovable things, unlovely things, and the only thing that keeps you from curling your lip is a choice of love. So we are all individuals, but we are all part of a whole. We are responsible to God because of our individuality, and we are responsible to the body of Christ because, of our, because God has willed that we be subsumed in this spiritual organism. And yet we are fallen people, so this isn't easy stuff. This is hard work. It is against our nature. It is against my nature and it is against yours to subsume ourselves in a whole that is not me or that is not you. To give up our rights for the sake of a different organism of which we are only a part and yet God has dictated, as he has every right to do, that we subsume our rights in this body of Christ. The church of Corinth failed to do this in almost every category. And so one of the questions I believe that we need to be asking ourselves is, is our involvement in the body of Christ resembling that which was occurring at the church of Corinth? Is it, I am here because I am the main thing? I am, I am functioning in this body of Christ because I've got something to offer. They need me is, is one way that this can come out. Am I here uh, merely because I'm obligated to be? Am I here because I was pestered into it? Let me encourage you. There are people here who love you who will do almost anything for you because they really do think of you as a brother or sister. People who love you that much, it's really worth to get knowing. You really ought to get to know those people and to be willing to love them like that in return. And if you've got a whole crowd of people who love one another like that, a lot can be accomplished. A lot of good things can happen. Things to our good and things for God's glory. But we must, in our individuality, contribute to the body of Christ. It's really hard to walk without a little toe. Did you know that, your fifth toe? The one that's out here on the side? I thought of taking my socks and shoes off, but then I thought, no, won't be doing that. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? That's one of the smallest bits of your body. And yet, that toe contributes so much to your balance that if you lose it, you have to relearn how to walk a little bit. Other toes have to come in and help. If you are part of this body, and you think of yourself as a little toe that doesn't do much, well, let me tell you, we need you. And even if you don't think you do much, that's not God's opinion of your place in this, the body of Christ. God's opinion is that you've got all kinds of good things to do, and he wants you doing them to glorify him, the main thing, and to build up your brothers and sisters in Christ, the love that we should be having for one another. This is the body of Christ. That is a statement of ownership. It is not my body. It is not your body. It is not even our body. It is his. And it needs to be used and exercised according to his instructions and according to his directions. He died so that its individual members could be redeemed and he died so that it could be made 
so that it could be assembled in communities. The first one was in Jerusalem, but there have been other bodies of Christ by this illustration in millions of communities throughout the world since. He intends that this body of Christ, the church, be his bride. So you are all the body of Christ. We are a unified whole. But you are also individually members of it with important things to do, necessary functions to fill according to God's glory. How does this body function? What different parts are there? I, in my physical body, have fingers and toes, eyes and ears, a mouth and a nose. What are the limbs of the body of Christ? What makes up the body of Christ? Well, earlier in the context, and we're not going to go there, but earlier in the context, we were told that the, the human body was assembled according to God's will. I have ten fingers because that, is, that was God's sovereign decision. He made mankind with ten fingers, ten toes. Now, there are some exceptions to this, to be sure, but the general rule is that God has made mankind to look like you and I all look. In our variation, there is a great deal of similarity. And God has willed in his sovereignty that it be thus. And Paul, after having said that, says this is an analogy. God has willed the church in Marshall or whatever community that you are from, whatever church that you attend normally, God has willed this church have you as one of the members of that body. Are you functioning as a member of the body of Christ? God has appointed the various roles that are available in a body of Christ. They are not self-appointed. God is the one who sovereignly determines these roles. Desiring to do a thing like be an apostle or a teacher or do miracles or speak in tongues does not make it so. We do not will our place in the body of Christ. God appoints and gets to set the terms upon which he makes those appointments. And we're going to learn more of, these, more of these terms in the following verses. And so here we get to verse 28, and we've got this list. A list of different parts of the body of Christ. God has appointed in the church, first, apostles, then prophets, Third, excuse me, second prophets, third, teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating in various kinds of tongues. And so we've got this list, and Paul clearly has some kind of priority in mind here. And the first list, the first in the list is apostles. Now, there were initially 12 apostles, right? And then there were 11, because Judas betrayed Christ, and he was removed from that role, that title. And then his place was filled in the, first of, in the first bit of Acts, and we'll go to that passage here in a minute. And then we also find that, that Paul was added as an apostle. And so there are, in the New Testament, at least 14 individuals who, for a period of time, filled the role of apostle. All right? Now, this can get a little confusing because other people in the Bible are called apostle, but in a more general sense. Now, th this is partly where some of our confusion comes from, I think. The word apostle, as we know it, comes from the Greek. The Greek word is apostolos. So, you know, oh, we, did, th we don't have a word in the English that means apostle. We just have apostle. And the formal translation, the general use of the word, would be someone who is sent, sort of like a messenger or an ambassador. Um, and so there are occasions in the New Testament when the word apostle is used, not in the formal sense of these 14 guys, but in a less specific sense, just using it in a general sense, saying this person is a sent one. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to kind of track a little bit of this in the New Testament and ask what makes a person an apostle in the formal sense? What makes a person like one of the 14 that we do know about who are called apostles in the formal sense? So we're going to leave 1 Corinthians for a little while and jump around a little bit to various places. So let's first of all go to uh, Acts chapter 1. 
I was going to go to one of the passages that lists all the apostles, but I think you guys believe me that they're there. So we've got this list of 12 apostles that shows up in a number of places in the New Testament. And then Acts chapter 1 acknowledges that Judas, being dead and a betrayer, is no longer an apostle. And so Acts 121 tells us the process that the other apostles use to fill the empty space. Uh, we'll start in verse 15. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers, and this is before the coming of the Holy Spirit, so this is pre-church. The company of persons was about 120, and he said, Brothers, the scripture has been fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle of it, and his bowels gushed out, and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called, in their own language, Akaldama, which is the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. All right, so at the time of the role of apostles not being 12 but 11, what do the apostles do? They say, hmm, what does God's word say about this? Is there any direction that we can get to see if we need to do something about this? And look, here we are. We need to elect a different person. We need to fill his role. His office will be taken by another. All right? So the first thing that they do is they say, okay, we need to find out from God's word what we're supposed to do. Now this is smart, right? We don't invent it, we merely study it and apply it to our lives so that we can be doing God's will. So, what are the rules then that they apply in their wisdom and guidance from God to figure out who should fill that role? So they've, they've determined from God's word that they need to fill the role now we need to study from them in the book of Acts how they filled it. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went out and among us, beginning from the baptism until, uh, um, of John until this day when he was taken from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. So we have here criteria. To be an apostle, this person needed to be a witness of the whole ministry of Jesus Christ, a faithful attender of all that Jesus did, just like the rest of the apostles, just not called an apostle, from the time that Jesus was baptized by John until this time. So that's requirement number one. Now let me ask you this. Is there anyone alive today who fits that requirement? No. Was there anyone alive after the first century who fits that requirement? No. All right? So no one can be an apostle anymore. Apostle is a closed office. It's not something that's possible anymore in this formal sense. Let's keep reading. Um, and they put forward to Joseph called Barsabas, who was also called Justice and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas had turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. And so there you have it. An apostle needed to be someone who saw the ministry of Jesus from John's, from John's baptism of Jesus until this time. He needed to be a witness of the resurrection of Christ. So the, the role apostle is no longer out there. It's no longer possible. There's one monkey wrench in this nice, tight system, however, and that is that Paul repeatedly calls himself an apostle. We've been seeing him do that and stand on this authority as an apostle in um, the book of 1 Corinthians. And he does it in his other epistles as well, often. He's like, guys, I'm an apostle. Why are you challenging my authority? I am sent by Christ like no one else except these other 12 are. Why are you listening to these other guys who claim to be super apostles? I am an apostle. I don't need the super. God sent me. 
So how do we deal with this? Is, is, is the Bible breaking its own rules? Well, no. There's a difference between us recognizing a system that was used and applying that to our day and our time and not allowing for God to make his own appointments in the case of Paul. Um, we all know the account of Paul's calling into ministry. God took him from being the premier persecutor of the early church and on the road to Damascus said, Paul, I've got different plans for you. You can't keep doing what you're doing. You've known for a long while that this is not right and that they're actually right. And you know that you need to serve me. And God took him out of his role as persecutor and made him the most fruitful missionary this world has ever seen. Um, when we think about the Apostle Paul not fitting the Acts 1 paradigm, I don't think we need to be worried because God is allowed to pick someone and send him in, this, in his own way. Now, how is it then that if God picked Paul, he couldn't also pick someone else? Well, Paul, I think, also fits some of this criteria. Of course, he wasn't there during the ministry of Jesus Christ from John all the way up until um, the resurrection, but he was a witness to the resurrection of Christ because he tells us elsewhere, and we're not going to go into those passages. We don't have time for that this morning. But he, we, he tells us elsewhere that he saw Christ and that he was taught by Christ. Uh, we actually saw that when we looked in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. Jesus told me how things went that last night. I am basing my instructions on his instructions. So... The Apostle Paul is a genuine apostle. But other people get called apostle. Um, Paul is called an apostle with Barnabas when he's sent on his first missionary journey in Acts 13 and 14. There's some verses there. I was going to spend a little more time here, but it's just not how it worked out. Um, the foundation of the early church was laid by the apostles. Jesus is the cornerstone. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22. And that foundation stands. It's there and everything is built from them. There are no more foundation stones to lay to continue to use that analogy. The office of apostle is closed. So we have apostles. Or maybe I should say we had apostles. The next, n the next individual gift in priority there is prophets. So God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets. There's a second level of priority here. And again, this is a word that is transliterated from Greek into English. Apostles was apostolos, prophet is prophetes. It's as simple as that. And so again, it's not a situation where the English language has its own word, but rather that the English language acquired a word, which by the way, the English language does in an annoying way degree. Um, and so this is not unusual. And so apostolos excuse, and, and, and prophetes. Now, when we think of a prophet in God's word, there are a lot of things that a prophet does or can do. I can identify at least three in the Old and New Testament. And when we think of someone doing a prophecy or prophesying, a lot of times we think of someone telling the future. But if you look at the Old Testament record, the vast majority of what the prophets did was actually um, correcting the sin of the people of Israel. And there are also times when prophets would clear up confusion regarding what God's will for his people was. I think probably the best Old Testament example of this is Moses. He did all three of these. And his time is similar to that of the book of Acts, right? What was happening during the time of Moses? The people of Israel were being transferred from a condition of slavery to that of a nation. They were transferring from a very rudimentary sacrificial system that I don't think that they were 
practicing very faithfully. I think there was a lot of idolatry present among the children of Israel when God extracted them from Egypt. I don't think they really did well at that. So they were being transferred from that simple system that they probably weren't doing right to a very, very comprehensive system of how to know and obey and please God and thereby qualify for his blessing. This is very much like the book of Acts. The book of Acts is also a time of transition, right? People are transitioning away from the law and into a, a different era, into the church, into an age of, of a different way of working. So Moses was a prophet. He prophesied, and that is that he revealed the future. Let's look at a few cross-references here. Deuteronomy chapter 18. Moses told the future, and his prophecies came true. Um, Deuteronomy 18, 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him that you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, let me not hear again the voice of my God, for I see this great fire more, lest I die. And the Lord said to me, they are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them and I, as I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will requite it of him. So this is obviously a prophecy of Jesus Christ, right? The people couldn't handle me from the mountains, so I'm going to send them a representative who is me, but in a, a method of delivery that is tolerable, that they can hear. Moses prophesied this, and it came true. It took a while, but it came true. So Moses, Moses prophesied. But he also prophesied and that he dealt with the daily issues of people in God's way, of, of a new people learning God's ways. And um, I'll just give you a cross-reference for that. A good example is Exodus 18. We're not going to go there for time's sake, but Exodus 18 reveals how Moses did this. And then also Moses prophesied. That is, he spoke truth to error as it manifested itself in the congregation of Israel. He rebuked them for the wrong that they were doing on repeated occasions. And the passage that I picked to kind of illustrate this is Exodus 32. And again, we won't turn there, but you know the, you know the account. It's the account of the golden calf. And so Moses deals with them in an Old Testament prophet kind of way. What are you guys doing? God has given you an opportunity to obey him and you're not doing it. Now get back on track. In the New Testament, of course, Paul himself, who we've been spending a lot of time with these last months, is a good example of this. Paul prophesied. He revealed the future. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 17, we see that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And you all are familiar with that passage. He also prophesied. That is that he dealt with the day-to-day -day -day issues of God's people during a time of revelatory transition. Ephesians 5, 22 through 6, 9 are a good example of this, I think. And again, we're not going to go there, but I'll tell you that that's the passage where um, Paul's, Paul gives very practical instructions in how we are supposed to work within structures of authority, within the family, within um, business, and, uh, and our jobs. And there is just general instruction. This is how Christians are supposed to behave in these settings. And then Paul prophesied. He spoke truth to error as it manifested itself in the congregation. And that is the book of 1 Corinthians, right? That's most of the book. Rebuking them for the things that they had messed up. And we will see as we get into chapter 13 that two of these senses of prophet are especially present during transition times for God's people. But I think one of them only persists in God's people through all times. Miraculous foretelling of the future is something that God says he's going to use to help people see that he's doing something in Revelation. And there are, there are actually specific instructions. If a prophet tells a near future prophecy, next month, in two years, this is going to happen, and then it doesn't happen, what were they supposed to do with that prophet? They're supposed to kill him. Careful if you're a prophet, right? You're putting your life on the line. And so that particular role was used to help the people understand that this man is willing to risk his life. He's given you permission to falsify and then execute him so that he can speak the truth to your error 
And so that when he says something in a middle-range prophecy, a couple hundred years, or in a long-range prophecy, stuff that happens in the apocalypse that we haven't even, we haven't even got a clue of what it's really going to look like yet, except for very confusing passages. The short-term prophecy underlines that God is speaking through this man. That level of the prophetic role is unnecessary in most times because most times are not when God is transitioning his revelation, when God is updating it and and adding to it. And then, of course, um, one of those roles also is only needed in times when there is that transition um, because we have the full revelation of God's word now. We don't need additional guidance. According to Hebrews chapter 1, we've got everything that we need. So God gave to the church first apostles, then prophets, second prophets, third teachers, and this is didaskalos. Um, no, we don't have much in the way of the English language that translates to this. Um, you hear the word didactic sometimes refer to teaching, so it is sort of present in our language, but this is where most of the resemblance stops. This item appears in Paul's lists both as a gift that is given to a person to exercise and as a person who's just doing it. Um, so it's, it's a little difficult to decide what exactly Paul means, so it's probably best to not try to be too specific. There are many teaching roles in the church. From the pulpit, I preach and teach, and I do one of the levels of prophecy I just discussed. In the Sunday school classroom, it's almost always teaching. And most of our youth ministry interactions are teaching. There are many, many teachers in this church. After this, it seems like matters of priority in this list fall a little bit further into the background, but not completely. Paul says, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, but he continues to, to, to grade these gifts a little bit by saying, then miracles. So he doesn't say fourth miracles, he says then miracles. But he continues in that by saying, then after miracles, gifts of healing, helping, and administrating, and various kinds of tongues. And so, while there is not a formal grade of all of these gifts, Paul, I think, is pretty clearly indicating that some of them have a priority. And in fact, he goes on to say, earnestly desire the higher gifts. Desire the, the highest gifts that you can qualify for. Earnestly desire the higher gifts. The first three gifts here are people who do ministry in the church. The last five appear to be some things that are done as ministry in the church. But still the distinction is not whole because like I said a minute ago, a teacher is a person, but it appears also in some of Paul's other lists that teaching itself is a gift. Um, and so let's, I think we need to be careful to not be too formal and probably not to be too claiming, I have the gift of teaching or I am a teacher. Um, I, I don't know how useful that is. The, the list goes on, and we are really picking up speed now, folks. I know some of you are like, come on, Pastor. Miracles. This is ground we've other, uh, already covered, right? Self-explanatory. Uh, extraordinary events to underline revelation. Gifts of healing.